whatever this thing that's being created here on earth, it seems to like to create, like to allow its children to play with certain uh, yeah. truths that they hold, this subjective truths that are useful for the competition or whatever this dance that we call life broadly is defined, Absolutely. not just humans. And and you know, I'm I'm glad you mentioned that because what I find fascinating is that the greatest scientists are on record saying that when they were making their discoveries, they felt like children. Mm -hmm. So Isaac Newton said to myself, I only appeared as a child playing on the seashore and every once in a while finding a prettier pebble mm -hmm. or a prettier shell. Whilst I think some, he said something like the infinite ocean of knowledge lay, lay, was lying before me. Alexander Groth and Dick, uh, who probably was the greatest mathematician of the second half of the 20th century, the fr French mathematician, Alexander Grothendieck, uh, wrote that uh, discovery is a privilege of a child. The child who is not afraid to be wrong once again, to be, to look like an idiot, you know, to, 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 to try this and that, and, and I'm paraphrasing, and go through trial and error. That is for them, in other words, for them, uh, that innocence of a child, who is not afraid, who has not yet been told that it cannot be done, okay? That was essential to uh, scientific pursuit, to scientific discovery. And now, and now also uh, compared to Pablo Picasso, a great artist, right? So who said every, every child is an artist. The question is to, how to preserve that as we grow up. Do you struggle with that? You're one of the most respected mathematicians in the world. Uh, you're Berkeley, you're like, this, this, this is a stature. You're supposed to be very like, you know. Ivory uh, Tower. Kind of. yeah. Sometimes I joke, I say, I, <laughs> I, I, take, I take an elevator <laughs> to the top of the Ivory Tower every day, yeah. <laughs> yeah. And you're supposed to speak like royalty. Uh, do you struggle to like uh, strip all of that away to rediscover the child when you're thinking about problems, when you're teaching, when you're thinking about the world? Absolutely. I mean, that's part of being human because when we grow up, I mean, the, all of them, all of these great scientists, I think they were so great in part because they were able, to, they yeah. maintained that connection, okay? And that fascination, that vulnerability, um, that spontaneity, you know, and uh, um, kind of looking at the world through the eyes of a child. But it's difficult because, you know, you go through education system and for many of us, uh, it's not especially helpful for maintaining that connection, that we kind of like, we are being told certain things that we accept, take for granted and so on, and little by little. And also we get hit every time we act different, okay? Mm -hmm. Every time we act that doesn't, in a way that doesn't fit sort of the pattern. Mm -hmm. We get punished by the teachers, get punished by parents and so on. And don't get respect when you act childlike. In, right. in your thinking, when you are fearless and uh, looking like an idiot. That's right. Because there's a hierarchy in Nobody society. wants to look like an idiot, you know? Yeah. Once you start growing up, or you think you're growing up. Yeah. In the beginning, you don't even think of, you don't um, think in these terms. Mm -hmm. You just play, you're just playing. And you are open to possibilities, to these infinite possibilities that this world presents to us. So how do we, I'm not saying that education system should not be uh, also uh, kind of taming that a little bit. Obviously, the goal is balance, that acquiring knowledge so that we can be more mature and more discerning, more discriminating in terms of our approach to the world, in terms of our connections to the world and people and so on. But how do we do that while also preserving that innocence? of a child. And my guess is that there is no formula for this. It is a life is an answer. Every life, every human being is one particular answer to how do we find balance? <laughs> <laughs> uh, that's one in imperfect approximation, approximate solution uh, to the problem. But we can, look, we can look up to the great ones yeah. who have credentials in the sense that they have shown and they have proved that they have done something that other humans appreciate, our civilization appreciates. 
say, Isaac Newton or Alexander Grothendieck or Pablo Picasso. So they have established their right to speak about these matters. And we cannot dismiss them as mere madmen. They say, okay, well, if, if the same thing was said by somebody who never achieved anything in, in, that, in, in, their, in their field of endeavor, you would be, it would be easy for us to dismiss it. But when it comes from someone like Isaac Newton, we take notice. So I think that's something important that they, they teach us. And especially today, in this age of AI, of course, there's a big elephant in the room always, <laughs> which is called AI, yeah. right? And so I know that you are an expert in the subject. And we are, going, we are living now in this very interesting times of new um, AI systems coming online pretty much every couple of weeks. So I kind of, um, to me, uh, that whole debate about what is it? What is artificial intelligence? Where is it going? What should we do about it? Um, needs an influx of this type of considerations that we've just been talking about. That, for instance, the idea that inspiration, creativity, doesn't come from accumulation of knowledge. Because obviously a child, a child has not yet accumulated knowledge. And yet the great ones are on record saying that a child has a capacity to, to create. And an adult credits the inner child. The inner child, yeah. Uh, for this capacity to create a, a, as an adult, you see. That's kind of weird if we take the point of view that everything is computation, everything is accumulation of knowledge, that just bigger and bigger data sets, finer and finer on neural networks, and then we will be able to replicate human consciousness. If we take that point of view, then what I just said kind of doesn't fit. Mm -hmm. Because obviously a child has not been fed any training data, <laughs> as far as we know, yet they're perfectly capable of, of, you know, of distinguishing between cats and dogs, for instance, and stuff like that. But much more than that, they're also capable of that, you know, wide-eyed, you know, sort of perspective. So does it, can it really be captured, that perspective, that sense of awe, can it really be captured by competition alone? I actually, I don't know the answer. So I'm not sort of trying to, uh, to present a particular point of view. I'm just trying to question um, any theory that starts out by saying life is this or consciousness is this. Because when you look more closely, you recognize that there are some other things at play which do not quite fit the narrative. 